Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we're going to be talking about some news from Elon Musk. He has established a new company called X Holdings. Take a look at some of the details behind that. Then we'll continue discussing Tesla's earnings report yesterday, some criticism today about the regulatory credits assisting Tesla's beat. So I want to take a look at how Tesla's numbers came in, excluding regulatory credits, and a couple other things from earnings. And we also have news on the boring company. All right, so looking at the stock after reporting earnings, Tesla today finishing up 3.2%, but kind of a disappointing day considering that in the morning, Tesla was up over 10%. So the closing price today of $1,008.78. That's a little bit below where Tesla was trading just two days ago before reporting these excellent earnings. So of course, on Wednesday before Tesla reported, Netflix was dragging things down. And then today, even though the NASDAQ started out positive, kind of a straight line down just throughout the day with Tesla following it on the way down. And sometimes that's just how it goes. I know I mentioned this on the live streams, but Tesla right now, as listed on Yahoo Finance and Google Finance, is trading at 206 times earnings, but that is using the earnings before yesterday's report. Once that gets updated to the $7.37 that Tesla's at now for the last 12 months for gap earnings per share, that price to earnings ratio, that's going to drop from 206x to 137x. The multiple compression continues, and every quarter we go, that's going to keep happening, and that continues to raise the floor on where Tesla could reasonably trade, which is kind of funny because then you see these analysts with their low price targets in the three or $400 range, raising them every quarter by 15, 20%, just like we talked about expecting to happen, you know, six months ago or so. Anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about that stuff in a second, but I want to start off here with the X Holdings news. This is actually a triumvirate of companies that Elon has started, X Holdings 1, X Holdings 2, and X Holdings 3. And these were disclosed today in an updated 13D filing with the SEC from Elon Musk in relation to his investment in Twitter. So just right off the bat here, even though there has been discussion around some so-called company X, and maybe that could be used to merge to some extent Tesla, SpaceX, Neuralink, Boring Company, there doesn't appear to be any connection to that here. I do still think it's going to be relevant for us to discuss in terms of Tesla because this does involve the bid for Twitter. And the bid for Twitter involves Elon's capital. And of course, Elon's capital involves his stake in Tesla. So we need to understand what's going on with this. So we'll take a quick look at this 13D filing. Remember, 13D filings are used to update on active investor activity. We know that previously Elon had submitted an offer to Twitter's board to buy Twitter for $54.20 per share. As we talked about, Twitter then adopted the shareholder rights plan, which basically created a poison pill, which would dilute the equity in Twitter significantly if any investor acquired more than 15% of outstanding shares. Elon is at around 9%. So clearly the board trying to prevent Elon from acquiring Twitter. And that was kind of the last we had heard about it until this filing, which notes that Twitter has not yet responded to the previous proposal. Given the lack of a response by Twitter, Elon is exploring whether to commence a tender offer to acquire all the outstanding shares off common stock at that same price of $54.20, which Elon had previously said in that first offer that it was his best and final offer. So a tender offer is basically going directly to shareholders and saying, hey, I'll purchase your stock for 54.20, yes or no. And then that offer is generally contingent on acquiring a certain percentage of outstanding shares. We don't know exactly how this tender offer would be structured because Elon hasn't yet determined whether he wants to do this. This 13D filing is to say that this is a possibility that is being considered and that the financing has been lined up for it. Or in other words, funding secured. So this walks through financing for $46.5 billion. That is a little bit more than the $43 billion valuation that Twitter would have at a share price of $54.20. I assume that that excess, at least to an extent, is to cover the fees related with a tender offer that can be a more expensive process than the first proposal, which is likely why Elon didn't do this from the beginning. So anyway, that $43.5 billion, that's broken down into three parts. First is a debt commitment letter. That would be $13 billion in secured loans from a consortium of banks led by Morgan Stanley. I'm not entirely sure what asset or assets would be securing that loan. I looked for it, but this is a very long filing. It's 115 pages, so I'm not sure if that is explicitly stated. Anyway, that's $13 billion. The second part is a separate tech commitment letter, and this is a margin loan commitment letter. That's $12.5 billion, and the letter specifies that the collateral for this margin loan is expected to be satisfied by some of Elon's shares in Tesla stock. Now it's a margin loan, that is just collateral, so nothing that Elon would need to sell there, but it would present some risk if Tesla were to drop by a huge, huge percentage amount. It'd have to be something ridiculous, would have to work through the math, but I would expect probably greater than an 80% drop would be required for this to be at all concerning for Elon. And even then, that's probably just getting into the territory where, oh, you kind of have to maybe start wondering about it. It's kind of tough to say exactly because I'm sure there are some special things that apply for transactions of the size. But anyway, should be a pretty small risk. And then the third piece of this is an equity commitment letter, and that would be for the remaining $21 billion of this $46.5 billion. That is where these X Holdings companies come in. So there's X Holdings 1, X Holdings 2, and X Holdings 3. Though the first two, as you can see here, are the only ones listed on the equity commitment letter. 
And this letter lists Elon Musk as the equity investor. So kind of the first question that comes to mind, okay, is this all $21 billion coming directly from Elon? If so, where is he getting that money? As far as we know, Elon doesn't have nearly that amount of cash on hand. So does he then need to sell Tesla stock to fund this $21 billion in equity financing from these X holding companies to acquire Twitter? From my understanding, while that technically could be the case, I don't think that that is the intent here. I think the X holdings companies would be a vehicle for an investing group. There is another area in the filing that mentions an investing group, which would directly or indirectly make equity contributions to holdings and holdings will make equity contributions to Bidco, which would be the company that would eventually bid to acquire Twitter. So even though these X holdings companies are Musk companies, potentially that $21 billion that could be contributed by other investors entirely and then used in this transaction. And I think if we look at the dollar values here, that makes complete sense. Remember I said before that the valuation for Twitter was about $43 billion at $54.20 per share. Well, what is $43 billion times 49%? $21 billion. That would leave the remaining funds raised to cover 51% of the company, as well as the fees of this transaction. So again, from my understanding, what it looks like is happening here is that Elon is raising enough money through debt a little bit over $25 billion worth, half from secured loans, and then half from margin loans, collateralized by Tesla stock. If that understanding is correct, then Elon would own 51% of Twitter, so a majority stake, financed with the capital raised from this debt, and then the other 49% would be owned by X Holdings, likely a group of other investors. If that's correct, there would be no need for Elon to sell any of his current shares of Tesla for that initial purchase. Now, of course, on that debt, Elon would have to make payments, certainly on the secured loans, maybe not on the margin, but he may want to do that so that it doesn't grow. And for Elon to finance those debt payments, then maybe he'd have to sell a little bit of stock, but probably not all that much. So I think concerns around Elon having to sell any Tesla for this possible acquisition, remember the tender offer not actually filed yet, but I think any concerns there should be pretty minimal. All right, moving on from that topic, I do want to talk a little bit more about earnings here. First, just a quick look at analyst price targets, obviously a lot of those being updated today. We're not going to spend the time to go through all those notes. Maybe we can look at a couple of analyst highlights tomorrow if we do have time. But as we can see here from a table compiled by Nitzau on Twitter, Mostly positive reaction from analysts so far, unsurprisingly, with the numbers coming in well ahead of expectations. However, I have seen some concerns about the sustainability of Tesla's gross margins, the regulatory credits, obviously. Tons of time on the call spent talking about supply chain, materials costs. So even though we see this every quarter, analysts are still hesitant to model for gross margin increases or, in many cases, even sustaining the level of gross margins that Tesla's currently at. Anyway, on the price targets, probably the most attention-grabbing one today was Global Equities Research, Trip Chowdhury with a new $2,300 price target on Tesla, which is a new street high. All right, on these earnings numbers, I want to spend a couple more minutes talking about those today because I've had more time to comb through them, digest them, present them in a non-live stream fashion here. So what I've done in this table is shown the actual results all the way on the left. Those are what we had discussed yesterday, but like we had talked about yesterday, given the really high regulatory credits in Q1, and then especially some of the conversation that has followed about the regulatory credits really being a huge driving factor in that beat, I wanted to take a look at how the numbers come in, excluding regulatory credits in their entirety, both for Tesla's actuals and the forecast, the analyst consensus, and my own. And just for simplicity's sake, in all cases, this excludes tax considerations on those regulatory credits. So Tesla's actuals excluding regulatory credits, those are in the lighter teal, and you can still see that Tesla phenomenal results here. I mean, automotive gross margin X credits, like we talked about, 30%. Total gross margin, though, still 26.5%. Operating margin still above 16%, which, as we have talked about, is the highest in the automotive space. And then on the bottom line, still non-GAAP net income of above $3 billion, non-GAAP earnings per share of $2.64. Remember, analyst consensus, including regulatory credits, was for non-GAAP earnings per share of $2.30, so Tesla, even excluding regulatory credits, beat that estimate by 15%. And that's not even a fair comparison. You need to exclude regulatory credits from both for that comparison. And that drops the consensus to $2.03 per share. Tesla's actuals beat that by 30%. So yes, the regulatory credits did factor into the beat. But even stripping that out, Tesla completely destroyed analyst expectations on this earnings report. Analysts were 2% too low on revenue. They were 8% too low on gross profits. They were 240 basis points too low on automotive gross margin X credits. 320 basis points too low on operating expenses. And then, yeah, as we talked about, way, way off on the bottom line. I can see my forecast there too. And I don't want to pat myself on the back too much because as I said, going into this, there's always a lot of luck that goes into these estimates, but I'm very happy with my forecast within 1% on revenue, 1% on gross profit, within 3 cents earnings per share, non-GAAP, and within 1 cent on a GAAP basis. My GAAP net income was within $2 million of the actuals. Again, all this excluding regulatory credits. I do think it's a forecast worth celebrating a little bit, but I do want to focus in on the area that is a little bit different, and that's operating margin. So actual came in at 16.2%. My forecast X credits was 17%. 
A small part of that is that I was a little bit high on revenue. We'll talk about average selling prices here in a second, but the other main driver was R&D expenses. That was about $100 million higher than what I expected. I have no problem with Tesla spending money on R&D, and something they said that was actually very interesting on the call that I didn't catch until listening again is that this quarter Tesla was putting some of the costs from Berlin and Texas into the R&D bucket. Zach noted that going forward, those would then fall into automotive costs. That'll be important to pay attention to for next quarter because we may see automotive gross margin drop a little bit as that shift happens, but if that does happen, then hopefully R&D expenses also drop quarter over quarter. And even if they don't drop quarter over quarter, again, I'm totally fine with Tesla spending a lot of money on R&D because they've already proven themselves to be very efficient with that spend, so I have faith that they put it to good use. Anyway, great earnings report even without regulatory credits. The other thing I like to look at when we get these numbers is the average selling price. This is also excluding regulatory credits and any leasing revenue or cost of goods sold on that. So the average selling price did increase quarter over quarter, only by about $700. You may remember that in the preview, I was expecting somewhere around $1,400 or $1,500. So that's where I was a bit high on revenue. And then cost of goods sold, those did increase, but only very slightly, only about $100 per vehicle, even with the average selling price going up, which could be a mixed thing. And generally those more expensive vehicles are going to carry higher costs anyway. So we can see that Tesla has still been able to control costs well, and that led to an 80 basis point increase quarter over quarter, even though Tesla had that production downtime to deal with, and deliveries were basically flat quarter over quarter because of that. I mean, you can see here that Tesla earned, what, $15,500 per vehicle in gross profit. That would have come with very minimal additional operating expenses. So pretty easily could have had an additional $300 million of gross profit with maybe $250 million of that getting to the bottom line. That probably adds another $0.22 or so to earnings per share. Without that downtime, then Tesla probably would have posted a gap earnings per share around $3.10 and non-gap earnings per share around $3.45. Now, those numbers do include credits, but point being, a lot to be excited about here. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out from earnings is just that Super Bowl order rate chart for the U.S. that Tesla posted in the earnings deck. So we can see here that Tesla's orders after the Super Bowl basically doubled. If we assume for the U.S. that Tesla is getting you know 500,000 orders a year or so, it's probably a conservative estimate, but Somewhere around that ballpark is 1,400 orders per day. If you double that, you get an additional 1,400. That ends up being about $75 million in extra orders and about $25 million in additional gross profit from these orders that Tesla generated from the Super Bowl. And that doesn't even account for any residual impact of those advertisements. And yeah, it doesn't really matter too much because Tesla would have sold those vehicles anyway. But hey, shout out to the other automakers for helping Tesla out on that one. All right, last item for today is on The Boring Company. They have announced that they have raised $675 million at a valuation of about $5.7 billion in a Series C round. Personally, I think this is really exciting. I mean, when has there been a tunneling company that has had this sort of access to capital? Probably not ever. The Boring Company says that they're going to use these funds to significantly increase hiring across engineering operations and production to build and scale loop projects, including Vegas Loop and others, in addition to accelerating the research and development of Proofrock, which is their boring machine, and future products. They also shared some details on Proofrock. They say that Proofrock 2, which is the current design, is designed to mine at up to one mile per week. And they're working on Proofrock 3, which is designed to be even faster with a medium term goal of one tenth human walking speed or seven miles per day. Yes, that is seven miles per day. Now, obviously, it's not going to have 100% uptime throughout the entire year, but on a yearly basis, that's 2,500 versus the Proofrock 2 right now. That one mile per week would be 52 miles per year. So they're targeting 50 times faster than their current rate. Now, they do say that that is a medium-term goal, but they say in the short term, if each of the Proofrock 2 machines mines at one mile per week and the Boring Company produces one new Proofrock machine per month, then the Boring Company will be introducing 600 miles per year of capacity. And for context, they say that less than 20 miles of underground subway tunnel has been constructed in the United States in the last 20 years. This is extremely exciting. Now, obviously, the Boring Company tunnels are different than a subway tunnel, but, I mean, that's an integral characteristic of the whole idea. So definitely excited for that with The Boring Company, but that will wrap it up for today. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and we'll see you tomorrow for the Friday, April 22nd episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.